here's the thing. This story, this anecdote, stuck. If you ask me when exactly, why, I couldn't say. All I recall is that it happened on a train with a bloke I got pissed with while on a long journey. But it stuck, sunk into me like it was mine. In the way that a dream does, or a moment in a movie. When I was a kid, I saw this film called The Nun Story. And in it, Audrey Hepburn's lured into this nutter's cell by a woman who believes she's the Archangel Gabriel and beats herself with whips. And for the next year, I couldn't sleep. Every night, the curtain billowed and in crept a bleeding angel come to tear me to bits. I was 10 at the time, an artless little bugger. But the image of a mad shrew self-harming through some religious delusion freaked the fuck out of me. I lost the thread here. <laughs> this story, if I tell it, you may end up like the 10-year-old me. Can you handle that? Sometime in the mid-90s, I was traveling back from Dundee after a lecture. Things were happening in the world, and I was hungry for a view. In Rwanda, people were massacring each other. But in South Africa, the white government was abdicating power. That was something to celebrate. My dad drummed into me from an early age, there's a time to talk, and there's a time to reach for the baseball bat. It seemed a blend of both had some effect on apartheid. Over the years, I, uh, I had a tendency to opt for the non-dialogue approach when confronted with a racist. It often landed me in trouble. The train pulled out of Dundee. I settled down. Opposite me was a man, rough looking, in his forties, with skin that had seen too much sun, and these very pale eyes, like in those spaghetti westerns of the sixties. An hour into the journey, a fly, demented by captivity, began to swirl around my head. Finally, it landed in front of me on the carriage table. I raised my paper to end the episode, but my wrist was gripped by a giant hand, owned by the man opposite, who said simply, It's just a tiny soul trying to find a path to God. My instinct was offense, but the look in his eye was childlike, pleading. We began to talk in the way that you do on a train when you're bored, but there's a smidge of something compelling about the person opposite. He had an accent. I couldn't work it out at first, but clocked that he was a big man when he stood up to go off to the toilet for a piss. Big in the way that they make them in countries where they eat a lot of meat. So he sat back down and I said, I think I know where you're from. He looked shifty. It was the day that his country had become a democracy. And soon all of these thick necked sadists would be crying crocodile tears in front of forgiving clergymen and bleeding hard liberals and getting off scot-free. I guessed he was a bore. Six hours and 20 pints later, we connected in a way that you can on a journey like that. Where you tell perfect strangers things you wouldn't tell your oldest friend while dying in a ditch. And he told me this story. He had been part of the South African Special Forces in the Angolan War. A conscript, an 18 year old farm boy whose first taste of footwear was army boots. Six months into his service, he'd seen a lot of death. He said towards the end, he was bush fucked. In lay terms, suffering war trauma while in action. On a recce, his unit caught what they called a gook, a black terrorist trying to infiltrate his country. This gook had a wound so deep you could see the bones of his neck. I remember the boar's voice. The words he used, 
the detachment with which he told the story. He was fatally wounded. He begged me to kill him. Hour after hour, his retching and arriving were driving me insane. I didn't know how to help him. Or if I'd be court-martialed if I did. Help him end it, that is. Seven hours passed by. His cries were like the whimpering of a dying fox. Finally, I slid my knife into the wound to sever his spine. It seemed the quickest solution. I had to saw the thing. It took me five minutes. When his head came off, there was this hissing sound like his soul was leaving his body. I thought I saw something fly into the night sky. It seemed like a kind of a moth. I'll never know what it was. But since that day, I wake every night to the sound of tiny wings above my head. I don't know why he told me the whole thing. And over the years, I've tried to understand. He must have carried that with him for a long time. And never told a soul. Till that day on the train. Twenty years later. In another country. To a stranger. To me. To a man who in every other circumstance would have reached for that baseball bat and smashed him to bits. And I saw the fly on the carriage table. I'm not a religious man, but it hadn't moved through our entire conversation. Was it about forgiveness, you ask? <laughs> no. Too simple. Too easy. If he had wanted to unburden himself, he could have found a priest. Because the way he told that story was matter of fact. Like we were watching a vivisection. Like it was something tattooed in his mind's eye he knew was never going away. His cross. I like to think the whole thing was simpler. This massive, inward-looking, traumatized man who happened to be on a train at the same time as this young Brit he took a liking to then told a story he had never been able to tell. As he stood up to go, I said, your country was the most institutionally vicious on earth since the Nazis, with racism enshrined in its constitution, and you fought for its fucking army? He nodded that great head. I don't know why, but I asked what he did for a living. He said he never worked a day in his life. Wound up on some beach in the Sinai Desert six months after his military service, not knowing how he got there. Then spent the next 25 years in therapy, paid for by his granny. His eyes fell on the name badge in my suit. I'd forgotten to take it off after the lecture. He murmured, John Gabriel, as if trying to brand it into his memory. At that moment, dead on cue, the fly burst back into life. He watched it whiz off, and then he left. He must have tracked me down, because a year later, I got a letter. After we met, something happened. Although I spent two decades talking to psychologists, I can't find the language to describe it. All I can say is, the fluttering of wings stopped that day. I now work for an international organization helping soldiers with PTSD. Most of our work's in Africa. Your sincerely, Marius. What do I take from this? I thought about it. Never told anyone until today, just you. And all I can say is, Two people met on a train, had a chat, and something came of it. 
what that was. I still have no idea. But it happened. Like now. Now you know.